Welcome back to RP1 release and it's time to take a look at our prototype. So between the episodes I've been flying missions with our prototype 5 or have been and the prototype 5 is quite good. It's um it's been useful for science. However, uh, it has some well we've got some more technology and a lot we can use to make it better. So we can have a look at what we've got in here. So let's just take off this magnetometer boom. This is one of the actual uh, experiments that I was flying. So we have that science already. So for the moment, what I actually want to think about is maybe uh, the only concern I have for these attitude jets is that more about where they're placed. I'm concerned about leaving them. I, I, what I actually want them is up here, away from where the center of mass is. But I sort of at the same time wanted to shield them from um, any of the airflow. It could well be that they, they don't actually matter for airflow. So I thought, well, we should probably actually move them up and, and test them to see whether they're actually any better um, when we don't do that. You know, either the airflow won't affect them or burn them off, anything like that. So that's just a, a quick thing that we should probably do as a matter of course. However, however, we're actually going to be able to improve things a great deal more than that in this whole rocket because one of the other nodes that we spent on unlocked. And let's go and take a look at what that implies. So before I load the, or get rid of this craft, if you have a look at the um, the Delta V, it's 10,219 Delta V total, okay? And that, that's over a number of stages. What I will say, if I haven't already mentioned it in a previous episode, is you probably want something like Kerbal Engineer, and you want to look at the, the, the top stage up here. Look at the torque figure. When you're attaching various different experiments, please do check that torque is zero, or as close to zero as you can manage. Because at this point, we don't really have gimbling engines on the top stage. We only have an aerobee, and without gimbling engines, it can't counteract any um, any imbalance, if they want to put it that way, in where everything is loaded. So for, for the sake of keeping everything to zero torque, i.e. not pulling to one side, I would even consider putting two experiments on. You saw I had two magnetometer booms on. If you can't balance it with other experiments, make sure you load it with one either side so everything stays nice and uh, nice and central. However, so 10,219, let's don't save that and let's load prototype six. So prototype six is, uh, I suppose we're getting out of prototypes at this particular point, <laughs> is 11,154. Now a gain of an extra thousand delta V is no nothing to actually, um, nothing to sniff at. So I'm just going to move these up a little bit. Well, I say a little bit, <laughs> up near the top of this stage. Obviously we're firing from the bottom. There is a couple of RCS thrusters in there that will help with small, changes you could and i have used them for braking thrusters so that um, if you're in an orbit and you want to come down back and into the atmosphere you can spin everything around using the the rcs thrusters you really probably want two sets of these top and bottom uh does that actually make much of a difference to this 11154 if i just put another set down there what does that do to it uh well it takes about 70 delta v off okay i, I can live with that and then I'm just going to move these around. We're going to come back to these in a second. Uh, so let's just bring that right down to two. Again, I'm doing that. Uh, how, do they actually massless or are they not? Let's put one on. Uh, yes, they they do have a mass. You'll see the torques down here. So if I change that to two, it torques back to zero. Good. They're antenna, basically. And I've put them as far back as I can just to keep them inside the shell. They may not be again calculated as far as airflow is concerned, but I prefer to catch keep them protected somewhat until we move to you know sort of bigger rockets and stages. However, uh, we have the RCS thrusters and everything else, and this sort of forms a new prototype. Now, why is there a thousand or, or so gaining delta V? Well, that's because we unlocked tank three. So tank three high pressure version. Please do remember when you actually replace the tanks, you need to go to the high pressure uh, for at least these top two stages. And the bottom stage shouldn't matter. Nope, doesn't matter. Uh, people were saying, yes, there are lighter RCS tanks than the procedural ones. So if you wanted, uh, for example, this, uh, if you wanted um, a lighter tank, yes, some of the stock parts do. It just You just get less control some of the times with what you can put in them. So for the moment, we're keeping that as is. And you'll see the battery is probably, a little, I think it's a little bit larger on this one, or it may have made a change on the last one from last episode. This battery is 625 by I thought, 100 millimeters. 
and uh, it has 6,000 electric charge in it. That's like, quite a lot. And because I'm launching this for science towards, well, <laughs> we're launching everything for science, but launching this towards one of the poles, that gives it quite a few orbits. And that gives us the chance to collect science over every biome we possibly can. Uh, so, yeah, it's well worth actually looking at that. So, 11,000. It's not going to be enough to get us to the moon, but it's certainly enough to um, to be a much easier launcher towards um, the poles, where you go well into orbit. And that's almost a problem in that you can't really stop it in any kind of reasonable circular orbit. Uh, at least you can't go to circularization. You can certainly stop at a certain height and make sure we'll do that automatically. But because you don't have no relights, unless your next, unless this actually happens in this stage, then um, and it won't do that because we're at seven point eight for those first two stages. So we won't get to circularization with just those. And when waiting for the third one, I don't think. But it's worthwhile, you know, testing to see how close we get. So why don't we try this on a simulation and let's see how well it flies. And I should also notice we uh, well, I should note that we are now using Scatterer as well as 16K texture packs and all kinds of stuff for the Earth. So it is looking much prettier than default Kerbal. You see the coastline down there as well as various city different maps and stuff like that. Uh, the same thing will apply for the Earth itself. So if we go into map mode for a second, you'll see this is much, much more realistic and uh, pretty nice overall. So yeah, um, those mods are... Um, well, they're, they're not cheap as far as uh, the PC you'll need to run them is concerned. At least uh, that's certainly the case for me. But uh, for the higher res texture packs, please make sure you have like 16 gig of memory. Um, and you know, probably want a decent processor for that as well. But it's mainly the memory, the overhead for those kind of things. However, uh, we're now heading up towards uh, separation for the first stage. So uh, everything will go as normal. But we'll come back once we're up to the upper stage. Hmm being close to burnout. So here we are in the later stages of the upper stage, uh, the, the AJ-10 stage that is, and we've got 10, but 10 seconds of fuel remaining and we look at our APO. Now if we want to try and circularize, what we've got to do with this whole thing is basically stick to whatever that APO actually turns out to be. So let's, uh, that looks like 260, yes it is. And I've turned off auto stage. I turned off auto stage as soon as the upper stage payload fairings uh, were blown away. So at this point, we've got two minutes, 16 or two minutes, 15 seconds and a one minute, 15 second burn stage, which means split the difference. That's about 37 seconds we want it to actually take over with. Now, as soon as I actually do this, um, we're going to, um, are we going to have problems with circularization? Well, no, we shouldn't do. If I just get rid of that stage, uh, have I got, uh, no, I've not got any separation motors. It's, it should be safe to do that. I'm just going to turn RCS off for a second. So what's really going to happen here is that our RCS is now active and we'll kind of take a look at how much we've got left. We should have plenty. We can control this. If we dis disengage the autopilot, we can now set prograde. And as soon as I turn on RCS, you should see we're no longer using our, the, you know, the, the thrust forwards. But we will use to be able to use the thrust forwards to um, to basically settle the fuel in the tanks and then be able to trigger the final stage. So this is circularization effectively. To do that, we, we, want, we want to try and get to a circular orbit because that matters for the sun synchronous stuff because it matters for the um, it matters for the eccentricity. Now, have I got the orbit info? I don't think I have. Let me just bring up um, MacJeb's orbit info. Um, where are you, MacJeb? Orbit info. There you go. Okay. So orbit info can go down here. And you'll see eccentricity right now is 0 0.394. Now for Sun Synchronous, we want something that's like 0, 0.0 something <laughs> or, or thereabouts. Now we will have RCS to be able to adjust this, fine adjust this, if we can get close enough. The main problem is getting close enough because once this is, once we disable this engine, it's it really is disabled total <laughs> we have no option and i'm just going to start it now even though we're, we're past the point at which we should be thrusting forwards and we're going to start this final engine so this is just pointing at prograde now and we can we can pitch up a little bit but it shouldn't matter terribly our our apple will probably come down a little bit it shouldn't matter if we can actually make a circular orbit 
Now, right now, you can see that number is decreasing right there. And it's going down quite... Uh, you can also see it down here. It's probably a little bit clearer to see it here. You can see this number is going down fairly slow, but that will that will speed up a lot as we actually get closer and closer to this, this 260. Now, if I can get it around 230 just with timing, then that, that might be close enough that I can use the RCS to get us uh, on our completely circular orbit. The, so the main point is we want a really circular orbit and we want a certain inclination. Now, the inclination is wrong because this is just a particular... Um, uh, there, in fact, let me just concentrate. And there we go. So 302 by 250. Eh, you see the eccentricity is very, very low now. So that will actually do if we manage to get within 50 kilometers of each other on the APO and the, the periapsis. So the inclination is off, but everything else actually shouldn't be too bad. Now, it may well be that it wants us to get an APO of above a certain height, and I need to go and check what the mission is. But at this point, we're dead in the water. We have an orbit. It's perfectly fine. It's controllable. So I can now um, adjust this with IJK and L keys. So if I want to, I can just pitch... Oh, in fact, now I need to just turn off Smart Off ASS for a second. So let's turn you off. And this will also not equalize roll. So if I want to just do this now and let go, it's not going to correct itself. So we can use this to create spins and all kinds of other things. I've taken off the roll RCS. We can probably get a cluster at some point, but for the moment, I don't really care what its roll orientation is, just its actual uh, its heading orientation. It, it's sort of forward vector, if that makes sense. Uh, I didn't mention why I use these antennas, but what I had when I was flying some of the science missions was, although previously the probe's uh, antenna seems to do enough to be able to communicate back to the ground, and in fact it still actually says here that we can communicate back with the ground even without these antennas, remote tech is installed, and remote tech, because it only counts certain types of antennas as valid ones, then we actually need to use remote tech antennas. So these are the, the remote tech antennas and we can move them in a little bit into the side of the, the actual tank, but otherwise this actually works fairly well. And of course you can turn Smart ASS back on and that will let you correct this back to retrograde. And of course pressing H, I think it is by default, should let us essentially break for reinsertion. Now, as long as you have electric charge left, you can of course circularize again just with um, your RCS. So if we're on a retrograde section right now, let's just use, uh, I mean, we're nowhere near the nodes. So if we just go to the nodes, uh, we have unlocked the uh, the flight planning, by the way. So that is going to be something that's very, very useful for us. But if we just zoom in here a little bit and let's just get remove this orbital info off to the side, let's put it down here. We can fast forward and you'll see we're heading towards Perry right there, 251. So if we just walk forwards for a second, and let's wait till we get to Perry. It's going to come in towards the day-night terminator, so I want to do this just before we actually get there. And now it's going to correct us, so we're pointing still at retrograde, and at this point we can just press H, and you'll see the two thrusters at the back are firing. More importantly, we're also bringing down our apoapsis towards our periapsis height, so we are circularizing even more. If I held it for long enough, I can't. You can't hover over the the orbit info window when you're actually doing this, but you'll see that eccentricity has dropped to 0.003, and uh, the same thing will apply. Now, while it isn't too important for sun synchronous, uh, because close enough 50 kilometers, yeah, I mean you can probably time that manually. It matters a great deal more when you're creating um, satellites that are much farther out, because the orbital period here next to my cursor actually matters a great deal more. If you want to have a geostationary satellite or a geosynchronous satellite, you need the orbital period to be um, very, very precise. And to the point that unless you have really small RCS thrusters, you won't get it to be that precise. It'll be off slightly. And no matter how much you try, unless you edit the save game or if you're really, really, um, you're, you're really, really lucky, I guess, it starts to process them. So when you try to have uh, arrays of satellites in a, the same orbit, like geostationary orbit for for whether it's a GPS simulation or whether it's um well they're geosynchronous I guess um, but um, whether it's GPS or whether it's uh, any other system up there needing to be precisely over the ground for example cable and then that sorry satellite for TV and stuff like that it's always in the same place in the sky so you can point and dish at it without uh, <laughs> without complex uh, in, in you know uh, installation 
So all that kind of stuff, uh, you want to be in the same position. However, and you want them to be in the same position relative to each other because then you, they don't process around so that you end up losing contact. However, yeah, if you throw up enough satellites up there, they will find a way back in Kerbal Space Program. Depends how, how, how over the top you want to actually simulate your real life satellites. However, um, I'm happy with, with that if we can actually run this live. So I think that's enough for the simulation. And then we can go and take a look at what the mission contract allows us to do. But just before we do that, isn't that beautiful? That's that, that's that's Scatterer in one screenshot <laughs> and uh, RSS VE as well. So yes, um, the official instructions for RP1 will give you a link to don't install Scatterer and RSS VE. It's like EVE, but for real solar system. Don't install them by CCAN. Uh, if you want to install them, there are separate instructions for that link to from the RP1 instructions themselves, and they will also show you how to actually install it. There's also a custom texture pack. I'm using a 16K texture pack, which means the I, I'm, there's no way I could get anything higher than that. So the, the surface of the Earth, and I think Jupiter is also covered with a 16K, is as um, as nice as we can make it. So here's the mission. We have one year to do it, so we may have to tool things to get it within one year, depending on how much um, actual science you've spent on uh, science on locks you've spent on the, the technology tree uh, and the, the VAB and the, the tech. So one year, its peri has to be above 300. Now that's important because your APO is going to be higher even than that. So what we're going to need to do with our rocket is adjust the turn shape and nothing really but the turn shape to get it to loft higher initially. Let's say if we have, you know, 350 APO, then when our peri comes up with a final stage, it should get to the point where we can stop it around 300 or, or above that, because we want to get, you know, easily within 50 kilometers of, of the APO. So, you know, you need to give yourself time to do that. Eccentricity, it seems to be fine, 0.02 and 0.04, between those two, ban you, not to not less than, so it has to be slightly eccentric, but not too much. It says between 0.02 and 0.04, so hmm. <laughs> depending how many significant figures it does there, it might just be 0.03. We'll see. Inclination between 95 and 99, that's relatively straightforward in that you can tell Medjib to launch that direction and it will correct itself uh, as it actually goes up. And then check for stable orbit as before. And we will get uh, 18 grand for signing up and a 48 grand for completion. And that's pretty nice overall. You'll see I'm down to 175 grand. 175 grand is for a few reasons. One, I've been launching lots of these rockets. And you'll see this kind of a dappled texture here. This is actually more because of Scatterer. Um, if you own RSSVE, that is as well. So if I just fast forward, you'll see that texture moves because that's clouds being rendered above and light signing through, as well as the actual ground texture, which is a little bit different because uh, of the texture map of Earth. All right, so uh, well, what I've also done between the episodes is use that science to actually purchase a number of nodes. So if we just go into R&D for a minute, you'll see I've now taken what I was going to say I was going to take last episode, which is the Satellite Eurex Electronics Research. That gives us the solar panels, which unlocks that mission that we can actually just attach them to our existing upper stage, I think. Uh, we could put them inside the payload fairings so that we don't get them blown off <laughs> halfway up and it passes the sand barrier or whatever. And then we have early avionics and probes after that, and this unlocks a number of different uh, things, mainly stuff like um, that we can change our um, our procedural avionics. There's an upper stage and there's a booster control. And they are just basically technology, technology upgrades, makes it better. We don't yet have enough to unlock more sites down here because we need to upgrade this actual facility and that takes a lot of money. Uh, so we can't do anything above 25 sites just yet. But we will want to get um, a lot more sites anyway through going past the moon. And that, that's something that is a, a different topic once we're getting, getting even better launches. Further up here, I've also taken, we've also taken the solid rocket engines. So they will unlock give us the various baby sergeants. And to get us to the moon, what we're gonna need from low Earth orbit, you know, 250, 300 kilometers or something, we need an extra 3,260 delta V, pretty much exactly for an intercept. And uh, unlike 
<laughs> stock Kerbal, RSS, the, uh, just like real life, the moon doesn't orbit around the equator. So you can't just launch dead east. And uh, well, in fact, <laughs> it's even worse than that because the launch site isn't on the equator. So not only can you not launch dead east to travel along the equator in an orbit, you, you know, if you launch dead east, you'll end up at something like 26 degrees, 27 degrees inclined from the equator. And then the moon is also traveling around the Earth, but it's inclined at a different angle and it's also not um, not at the same time. So generally, if you're trying to launch for the moon, if I remember correctly from the last time I played this, you have to launch at exactly the right time so that the, the moon's orbit, the line, if you're trying to project that onto the surface of the Earth, is passing um, Kennedy Space Center as or close to as you're actually launching. So that when you're actually launching, you can launch at a certain angle. You can calculate that angle or well, you can look it up. Look it up. Trust me, don't calculate it. Launch at the angle that will put you into an orbit. But because the orbit of the moon is passing over the space center around the same time, those two angles are the same, I think, <laughs> if I remember rightly. If people in the comments will correct me if I'm wrong there, and I can be wrong. So, uh, yeah, do put in the comments if that's correct, uh, if that's incorrect. I remember rightly also MechJeff has a uh, ability to launch towards a specific target, i.e. a time countdown. And timing is very, very important, both with getting towards the moon, but also trying to intercept something that is in orbit. So let's say you're trying to do a rendezvous with a station. You're never going to be able to do it exactly. Uh, no matter how much you try, it's just not going to be perfect. But the idea is you cut down on the number of orbits you actually need to, to catch up to something or to slow down to let to let it catch up to you, depending on which way around you've got things in, in orbit. Um, but you want to get it that roughly right to cut down on the number of orbits because, you know, if you're only two kilometers or three kilometers underneath something else and you're on the other side of the planet, it's going to take many, many, many orbits to catch up. That's not totally important in Stock Kerbal, but here you have life support. So if you're sending someone up to get someone else, they might run out of oxygen or food or water. You wouldn't think they'd run out of food but certainly water or oxygen. So yeah, you've got to be a little bit more careful with that. What we've also unlocked are these rocketry nodes. These are got lots of technology upgrades for our existing engines, and that will let our engines burn for much longer, which is quite important as well, because when we get towards the moon, I think one of the first, the first um, stages we can get towards the moon is something that's a very fixed amount of delta V. So you try to create a, no, a planning node in orbit with exactly the amount of delta V that you have, and then the only variable left is when you actually fire it, and then it'll hit the moon or be close. Of course, you can add RCS to do fine adjustments as well once you're halfway out or something along those kind of lines. However, then we've got 1959 orbital rocketry that has some new rocket types, um, various different stuff that is not part of RP0, but uh, yeah, we also have some extra uh, solid rocket motors. And then we have the really important one, which unlocks the AJ-10 mid uh, which is in here, if I remember right, or admit it's the next one. Yeah, it's the next one because that's the H1 engine as well. Um, yeah, that's uh, the Saturn 1. So we'll get into the Saturn series of vehicles. So yeah, you're in 60s at that point. However, AJ10 mid is got a huge um, rock, a cone on the back, a huge bell shaped uh, curve. It's basically for vacuum. And uh, does that have multiple uh, multiple ignitions? I don't think it does initially, but I think it then unlocks multiple ignitions. Um, do you have multiple ignitions, please? I think it does, just by default. It doesn't say single ignition, so that's the most important part. Uh, unlimited ignitions. Okay, that's fine. So you're able to just do lots of circularization with your AJ-10 stage and not your top end Araby or whatever you replace the Araby with. However, until that, or well, until the 1960s, we're sort of stuck with the current range of technologies and just upgrade, just like we did with the RD-103. We'll have the same things with the existing engines as well. So I spent all that science, um, and then we also unlocked entry, descent, and landing, which is basically just heat shields and uh, of various kinds. That'll help for return. Some of them are not rated for lunar returns. However, lunar returns have a, a much higher re-entry speed than uh, than uh, regular just orbital re-entry. Uh, I suppose you could try and bleed some of it off, but even so, yeah, you're putting your, your, your astronaut's life in your hands if you try such a thing. 
Uh, I don't want to try such a thing. Oh, we will have them in orbit a long time before they go to the moon. However, our unplanned, uh, unmanned um, craft will be going to the moon or sooner. And then we've got uh, supersonic flight, and I've left that as last in the list. So over here, we've got our list. And you'll see we've got um, a number of things. I've got the upgrades invested in, still to a large degree, R&D, 8.65 science per year. That does sort of mean that the VAB is still really quite slow. I, but I, what I really want is to unlock the technology and then we'll concentrate on the VAB. But um, yeah, balance that as you wish, play through and see how it actually goes for you. I still have an AJ-10 prototype 5 going. That is the Tank 2 version. But since it was already starting to build, I may as well fly it regardless. And that pretty much is that. So we can now think about using Prototype 6, which has more control in the RCS, to fulfill this mission. However, we should check how long it actually takes. Let's go and have a look. And yes, here we are. It's going to take 206 days to actually build. So it will still fit within a year. However, uh, that's probably down to the lack of tooling, I would think. Yes. We've got a bunch of stuff that we haven't tooled yet, and we're down to 175. I'd rather not spend something on a one-off, and I'm hopeful that this uh, some synchronous satellite is going to be a one-off because uh, the next, well, it's going to be this and the solar one. So um, after that point, we'll probably have to redesign at least the upper stage, and we'll be replacing some bits and pieces for that. So yeah, um, for the moment, that can stay as it is. What I'm actually going to do now is just try a simulation of those parameters for the sun synchronous stuff. We haven't got the mission yet, but we should certainly see if we're able to hit the target. So here we are at launch pad, and uh, it does again look quite nice because of Scatterer. We have nice shadows uh, here going on. So we have turn shape, and we can alter this to whatever we like. So if we tell it to, tell it to go to 55, you see if I drag this down, you see it basically steepens the angle at which we take off. So let's just try it around 55, and you'll see what the rest of the parameters are. Exactly the same, nothing different to the first simulation. But what we should see is when I bring you back, we should be at uh, an APO that's, we want it to be around 350, and we can adjust this until we actually get that kind of performance. So let's skip forwards until we're much, much higher. Okay, so that's probably cutting it a bit fine. 307 kilometers is probably a little bit fine. However, of course, we've got the rest of the next stage available. So we can uh, disengage the autopilot. And uh, we can get rid of that stage. So we're still perfectly fine. And now we have 2 minutes 15 seconds to wait. Or at least you don't, but I do. And 100, uh, 1 minute 15 here. So we want to see if we can get things correct. So right here, the eccentricity is nowhere near yet because we're nowhere near orbit. However, uh, what we do have is inclination of 96 degrees. And it needs 95 to 99, so we should be perfectly fine. And uh, we should be able to just essentially correct for um, we're using our RCS to whatever our vector is. There we go. We can turn our uh, SAS on to, to correct things, even if we don't want to use Smart ASS, etc. And we can leave that there. Fine, once it settles. Yep, yeah, there we go. So we can leave that there, and uh, then we have it coming up. So I'm going to see how close I can get and whether I can actually get within the parameters using the simulation. Let's fast forward and see how it goes. Okay, so not quite as close. <laughs> so our eccentricity is off. That would need to be 0.03-ish. And our peri is 158, which means we need to go to APO and then try and use the rest of our RCS fuel. Uh, again, this may be why we need an even higher loft, because as we actually approach um, our APO and fire, Essentially, the, the further we are from the APO when we're actually getting the orbit correct, so uh, I need to just take a look at how much fuel I've got left, so maybe adjust it down by an extra 20 seconds, then divide by two instead of just dividing the total by two, and then that'll help us keep things circular. So let's just try and see how well we can actually correct this, if we even can. So there's our APO. And what we would need to do is go all the way around until we are pretty much at APO um, or close to APO. So let's just warp all the way around. In fact, nope, uh, that's the wrong direction. <laughs> I need to just turn the Smart ASS off in a second as well, but that's fine for now. Warp this side of APO. That helps. And there we go. 
So it is going to be in darkness, unfortunately. Now, I do have Planet Shine installed, so that does help a little bit, but not a huge amount by comparison to other things. So now we should be pointing, or it should be reorienting us using RCS to point prograde again. And we're only really going to get one chance to actually use this uh, use this up. So, um, yeah, we've got nitrous oxide. I've got about 80% of that fuel remaining. So uh, now I guess we can just hold H at this point. And you'll see our APO is raising, so 261, 262. Uh, if we can get this up to above 300, then that'll actually work. But I'm not quite sure. I think we actually probably need to adjust this turn shape maybe to about 60%, and that, that should do. However, the concept is, is perfectly fine. We had more than enough left in the tank, in the in this this main tank, to actually do this. So it's just a matter of getting your turn shape right, and uh, that mission shouldn't be a problem. We should give us an extra 60 grand or so. Obviously, this rocket costs a bit because we're not tooling it, but um, you know, you still should be perfectly fine to keep that within within the mission. So yeah, we should be able to leave it from there. I'm just going to skip forwards a little bit and let's see if we're able to get this to be a success by increasing this. Uh, I suspect we, well, we might get over 300, but we might not get the, the eccentricity right. That needs to be 0 0.03. So let's skip forwards. Okay, so we've got past 300. So that would fulfill the first mission contract uh, criteria. And we just passed APO as well. So we are on the way back down now. However, at this point, we're just using the rest of our fuel up to bring the eccentricity in. So you'll see eccentricity is up at 0.05. And if we can drop that to 0.03 before the fuel runs out, well, that's great. We, we, would, we would have gone ahead and uh, succeeded in the mission. However, well, yes, it doesn't look like it's going to hit that. It might even hit 0.04, which might be enough. But uh, it would have to be pretty close. Uh, yeah, let's, yeah, our fuel's running out. 0.05 still. Oh, no. <laughs> We're entirely out of fuel now. Uh, we can't get anything else going. However, it's close enough that we don't need all that much of a, of a change. So maybe changing this to 57, 58, and me timing things a little bit better would actually solve that. So there's nothing wrong with the rocket. It's mainly the, the stupid human between keyboard and chair that's actually causing the problem. However, we, that's it for today's episode, Syn Synchronous Satellites. Uh, and yeah, just you want your inclination between 95 and 99, eccentricity low, and you can see even we're approaching the right eccentricity and it, we're not that close to being circular, but it's still more circular than we've been doing so far because we haven't really cared about the, the rocket's orbit whatsoever. So I hope you've enjoyed today's episode. If you have, give it a big thumbs up and we'll see how uh, that goes on from here, whether people want to see more RP1 or if you want to see, see me do other series, more Stock Kerbal or even Factorio or anything else, do let me know in the comments down below. More than happy to hear it. Um, and we will come back probably... Uh, probably the next episode is going to be Solar Satellites. That should be relatively straightforward to actually get. And then we'll see what missions and new contracts we get from the Mission Control. Otherwise, we'll see you next episode for some more Realistic Progression 1 release. And as always, guys, thanks for watching.